Welcome to the Hornets Hivecast, presented by Charlotte Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates, the official eye, ear, nose, and throat care provider of the Charlotte Hornets. Here's your host, Sam Farber. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Jake Fisher, senior NBA reporter for Yahoo Sports and the author of Built to Lose, How the NBA's Tanking Era Changed the League Forever. Jake, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for the kind intro. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's it's great to have you here. It's great to get uh, an expert in the game and a, a national outlook here locally in Charlotte. Obviously, it's been an eventful year for the Charlotte Hornets. The franchise has a new ownership group led by Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin, a new executive vice president of basketball operations and Jeff Peterson. There will be a new coach. There will be a new practice facility not too long after that, a reimagined arena. A lot is happening here in the Queen City. How do you see the franchise structurally positioned for the future? You know, back when the interview process began for the lead executive job that went to Jeff Peterson, assessing what this position, what this organization was going to look like, I was comparing it a lot in my conversations with league executives to the Wizards. And I think when you net out all the factors, the compilation of a young roster that already has an all-star in LaMelo Ball, a really impressive you know, three-time Rookie of the Month now and Brandon Miller – when healthy Mark Williams looking like a true pogo stick on both sides of the ball, plus the ownership group that you mentioned who are clearly willing to put their money where their mouth is to make this the premier destination in the NBA. That's what they keep saying whenever they have taken public uh, appearances and sat in front of microphones such as this. And it seems like all that combination, the investment and wanting to bring the right people here to me, it's a very bullish opportunity to be a Hornets fan right now, and there's plenty of people around the league who are looking at this organization and franchise as one that they want to be a part of. I like that you went directly to the players as well. The the other stuff is the infrastructure that supports the team, and it has to be right or else the team's not going to reach its full potential. But you did go straight to the core on the floor. LaMelo Ball, one of the youngest all-stars in the game's history, and but no questioning the talent that he's already shown on the floor in the NBA in a short period of time. Brandon Miller, as you mentioned, three-time already Eastern Conference Rookie of the Month. Mark Williams. The core seems to be there. What do you think of it compared to other young trios or just generally speaking cores that teams have assembled around the NBA? When you look back to Orlando's rebuild from the post-Dwight Howard era back in 2013-2012 era, that was a storyline featured in my book that you kindly mentioned at the top of this. A, A struggle that I heard from a lot of people in that organization at that time was it was difficult to have all those pieces fit together from a roster standpoint without having that like lead dog and then a, a clear hierarchy and a pecking order and kind of like a role system outside of that. And the fact that you have your bookends, you have your point, your pick and roll combo, when healthy, of course, of Lamella and Mark, and you've got this two-way, really malleable, clearly a versatile skill set guy in Brandon who obviously has a super smooth shooting stroke that – even it's my first time seeing him live in person this week at the NBA level, not just summer league. Even the range behind the line, right? He's if anyone's watching these games, obviously everyone listening to this show is. He's shooting from thirty feet sometimes, and I think that collection, that one three five, they're the most important pieces on the floor, and you can find connective guys in between that as long as you have that starting point, and the fact that. This situation already does. Lamelo's already been anointed an all-star. Brandon seems to be well on his way to being in that conversation. It is a massive, massive benefit for any new head coach coming in here, for the front office that's going to be continued to shape under Jeff Peterson. And to your point, yeah, everyone who will be joining on that function, they will to anyone worth their salt, they will all admit and recognize that they don't necessarily matter anywhere near compared to how good the players are, how much the talent rings out and it's a really strong starting point to have those three guys the first step in terms of putting the core together is is finding the talent the second step is seeing it start to mature and hopefully make playoff runs and deep ones at that it's way too early to say for certain anything but as you evaluate it from from your standpoint where do you see the ceiling potentially being for a trio like Lamelo ball brandon miller and mark williams i think the goal 
before we get to championships is to just be a perennial playoff threat, right? And Orlando's another good example of that, this team coming in right now where they take Palo number one last year. They already had some pieces in place, but they put together kind of like some winning principles on the defensive side of the ball under head coach Jamal Mosley last year, and that carried through to this season. And they've had their ups and downs just like everyone else, but the fact they've always been able to right that ship and get back to the principles and the identity that establishes themselves on that side of the ball is important. That's obviously something that Steve Clifford has made his calling card throughout his career. And I think just from my conversations and and being around the staff, I would be surprised if that teaching and his wisdom hasn't, you know, soaked like pretty indefinitely into a lot of the players here and you hope that that building block and that understanding of how team defense is really kind of the necessity to win at that level is a great starting point in addition to all the talent that you have. So you hope that you know these last six games that everyone keeps talking about trying to not just win, but put your best foot forward to get better, to grow, to develop. You hope that continues to add piece by piece and brick by brick. And eventually, with the resources invested here, even even seeing you know Vasa Micic and Davis Bertans come after the trade deadline, just that that caliber of heightened NBA talent and professionalism, and I think the greater clarity that exists here about how to win games on a night to night level, on a day to day basis, on bringing that winning mentality to the gym, to the plane, to the bus, that stuff is starting now. And I think it is only going to position everyone to put their best foot forward and to really. I mean, I'm not saying that's the goal next season here. I haven't heard that. But I think without a doubt, if healthy with another top, you know, hopefully three pick, depending on how the lottery falls, maybe a couple moves on the margins with some cap space. I think there's definitely a possibility this team could be competing in that play-in picture next season. Jake Fisher, our guest today here on the Hornets Hivecast, senior NBA reporter for Yahoo Sports. That tipping point of when you go over the the edge of accumulating talent to now you are talented and ready to make a run, it can happen very fast. You mentioned Oklahoma City, Orlando. They've made those enormous jumps this season to now being where they are. We've seen it with Sacramento and other franchises recently. As you mentioned, Charlotte already has LaMelo Ball. They have Brandon Miller, uh, Mark Williams just outside of the lottery, but certainly you know, he was right there uh, on the edge of it and clearly has a ton of talent. And another top five pick or top ten pick at minimum. Uh, we'll see how the, the ping pong balls fall here yeah. for the Hornets. Um, but we'll be coming into town. And Charlotte has accumulated multiple draft picks for the future as well as has cap space. Where do you see uh, the Hornets in, in terms of being able to accumulate whatever those final few pieces might be towards becoming that next team to make the jump. How do you think the Hornets are positioned to do that? We've talked about the core on the floor, which is a great term from you. I think a big piece just from a cap standpoint, and that math does rule all of team building. It's just the the rigid guidelines that every team has to work within. So any smart forward thinking front office is already going to be contemplating and considering the fact that Brandon Miller is going to be getting a big payday at some point. Mark Williams is going to be getting a big payday at some point. And it's the new nature of this new collective bargaining agreement that you're going to only have a tighter and tighter just space to work with. And every little piece, every $20 million player on that roster, there's only so many of those you can have now. So I think a lot of it will be determined by that and ultimately what other pieces that the Hornets want to start to fit next to these other guys, whether it's more of a connective playmaking four man or a switchable defensive guy in that spot, whether they want to find just like a marksman three point shooting floor spacer at that two spot in between LaMelo and Brandon, that's going to be a big factor here. Jake Fisher, our guest today on the Hornets Hivecast, senior NBA reporter for Yahoo Sports. You've been in Charlotte for the Steve Clifford press conferences and announcement, uh, and, and certainly an eventful time for the organization. He's contributed so much to the game, so much to the city of Charlotte and this organization, and is renowned across the NBA for his intellect and his expertise in the game in general and in defense in particular. Uh, it's been Pretty well laid out now that he'll transition into a front office role as the next step. Where do you see him being the biggest contributor? Because I I see a lot of different areas. He's been pretty 
committed to staying in his lane. He's the coach. You give him the talent. His job is to get the most out of it and not necessarily to wade into other waters. Now maybe he can uh, and offer an opinion on players. Clearly, there's no better person to test your defense against than Steve Clifford. Maybe the only thing better is to try and test your offense against him because he's the guy who's usually tasked with picking it apart. Where do you see him having his biggest impact moving into a front office role? It was interesting at that availability, kind of learning that there isn't necessarily an exact figure already established for him. And I think to Sacramento, where Alvin Gentry Similar age, around 60, when he departed from the Kings, they moved him into a front office role. He's really enjoyed being kind of an overall scout. Like, I see him on the road a lot in rival buildings and in the media section doing player, pro player personnel scouting and evaluation and intel gathering and whatnot. And he's, he's told me that he, fi- he thought that every front office should have a long term veteran head coach in it. To also bring that day-to-day coaching perspective into the more macro decision-making that happens at kind of like a thousand-foot level from a front office standpoint. Someone who's actually in the gym putting his hands on guys, sweating next to them, I think that does bring a lot of different perspective. And Cliff being someone who watches as much tape as anyone, who cares about teaching this game as much as anyone, and who's just so respected for being just a genuine down-to-earth really really good guy that's just whatever role he does find this could sound kitschy and and, and corny but i do think just having him in the building is going to continue to to bring light and positivity and and connection to the staff so it does seem like i said that they're still kind of figuring that out but to me i think any hornets fan should be excited that he'll still be around this building because he's gonna he's gonna contribute and he's gonna add in, in whatever capacity that is this Hornets fan is certainly very excited to keep him around. My last question for you, their team is going to obviously hire a new head coach and they're going to turn over every stone looking for all the best candidates without going into particular people that, that will be up for this job. I'm curious more your thought on why Charlotte is an attractive destination. We've gone over a lot of the reasons, but specifically for a head coach who is clearly going to be looking to want to come in and win and and start cementing their legacy either originally as a head coach or further as a head coach. So what makes this job with all of the infrastructure that's being built, the new front office, the new ownership, the core on the floor, what makes this job maybe more attractive than others or the most attractive it could possibly be as opposed to previous times that it's been open in the past? To come into a building where you're going to kind of be like an early founder of a startup where you're going to help be able to shape the infrastructure and just give a quick call to ownership and say, hey, we need this and snap your fingers and it's going to get there pretty soon. I think that's going to be very, very intriguing to a lot of young coaches. There's only 30, but sometimes you do want to make sure that you're going to a situation that you know you're going to have a shelf life and at least three years minimum to really establish your principles and start to build this thing out and grow as much as you want your players to grow too. You're going to have the runway to do that here with that core we've talked about, with the support you just mentioned. I think all of that combination together is going to be really, really intriguing for anybody. Jake Fisher, senior NBA reporter for Yahoo Sports and the author of Built to Lose, How the NBA's Tanking Era Changed the League Forever. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time, and uh, thanks for being here with us on the Hornets Hivecast. Thank you for having me. That does it for this edition of the Hornets Hivecast. Remember, the HHC is available daily wherever you get your podcasts all throughout the NBA season, with game previews every game day, reviews every day after, and in-depth interviews everywhere in between. I'm Sam Farber. It's been a pleasure and a privilege having you along, and we'll talk to you next time right here on the Hornets Hivecast. Thank you for listening to the Hornets Hivecast, brought to you by Senta, the official eye, ear, nose, and throat care provider of the Charlotte Hornets. For more coverage, visit Hornets.com.